What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. I'm your host, JT. We got a really good episode tonight. Going to be giving you guys my reactions to the Patriots Steelers Thursday night game. Colorado got a big time commitment from the number one offensive tackle in the nation, Jordan Seaton, and the haters were really mad about this one. Going to be giving my thoughts on it, what his commitment to Colorado means, what impact will he have on the Buffs in 2024. Got some predictions for transfer portal landing spots for all of the top transfer portal quarterbacks. We're also going to get into some really interesting reports coming out about Marvin Harrison Jr. He's undecided on his future. Is he going to declare for the draft? Is he going to return to Ohio State? And why Washington is being severely slept on when it comes to their ability to win it all in the college football playoffs? Before we begin, welcome. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. If you haven't already, leave a like, subscribe to the channel. Remember that every episode of the podcast that's uploaded on the channel is available in audio format on all podcasting platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcast from, the JT Sports Podcast is available. Rate us five stars on Apple and Spotify. Share the pod with your friends, family members, and acquaintances if you enjoy. And let's talk some football, man. And you know, as a Steelers fan, I'm not even surprised that we lost this game. If you've been following the Pittsburgh Steelers for over the last couple of years, you would know that Mike Tomlin, for some reason, never has this team ready to play Anytime they go up against inferior competition, and they are notoriously known for playing down the competition. And this game is a prime example of that. Now you're on the two-game losing streak. When you already are coming off a d- disappointing loss to the Arizona Cardinals, now you lose to the New England Patriots, bruh? I'm ready for Mike Tomlin to pack his bags and to get out of town. I don't want to hear no more excuses from the Mike Tomlin fan club. I don't give a fuck about not having a losing season anymore. I care about making it to the playoffs, winning postseason games, and winning Super Bowls again. And after losing to the Patriots 21-18 on Thursday night, can the Mike Tomlin fan club truthfully say that he's good enough? To lead the Steelers back to another championship? Because I don't think he is. He got outcoached by Bill Belichick once again. And Bill Belichick had Bailey Zappi in there carving up this defense in the first half. You see, Mike Tomlin is a really good raw-raw guy. He's a really good motivator. But when it comes to clock management and in-game adjustments, those are two areas that... He really struggles in. The defense played well in the second half. The defense is pretty much the only reason the Steelers offense was able to put up some damn points and they had a chance to win this game. But if it wasn't for this defense, this offense probably would have under 150 total yards. And when Kenny Pickett got injured, one of my friends came up to me. He said, oh, JT, cheer up. Mr. Trubisky isn't no worse than Kenny Pickett. I said, no, 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 you're wrong. Mr. Trubisky is hell of a lot worse than Kenny Pickett. At least Kenny Pickett doesn't turn the football over and is a lot better at reading defenses and finding open wide receivers than what Mitchell Trubisky is. Mitchell Trubisky should not be the starting quarterback of Pittsburgh anymore. I'm tired of seeing this fool in the black and gold. I don't know why the hell Pittsburgh thought it was a good idea to give this fool an extension. He's awful, bro. There's a reason why he's a backup quarterback, why he's a failed first-round pick. I'm freaking tired of watching the Steelers continue to underperform against bad teams under Mike Tomlin. When are we going to pull the plug, people? When are we going to see through the facade? Mike Tomlin's not a bad coach, but his time in Pittsburgh has expired, man. And we get another example why it's time to go in a different direction from Mike Tomlin. There's no reason why the Steelers should have lost this game to New England. I mean, the offense, you change offensive coordinators, right? You fire Matt Canada because he was the problem. But yet, the new OC, for some reason, doesn't know how 
to get George Pickens involved in the game. You want to know something crazy? Did you know on first and goal, the Steelers attempted a tight end pass? What, Cameron Hayward? What the hell are you doing? Like what Kurt Herbstreit said. Stop trying to get cute. Run the damn football, man. That's the strength of your offense. Why are you trying to get fancy doing trick plays on the goal line? I know the offense sucks and you kind of got to throw caution to the wind at times, but that's the wrong situation to do so. Not just that you have bad play calling, but you also have Mr. Trubisky, Actually trying to throw the football downfield for one of the few times that he did on fourth and two at the end of the game. That made no freaking sense to me. Why are you going to try to attempt the deep shot now when you didn't try to attempt too many deep throws downfield, but all of a sudden, fourth and two, game on the line, you want to try to go for it all. And then you're throwing the deep pass to Deontay Johnson? If you were going to take a shot deep on fourth and two, it would have made more sense to throw it to George Pickens, man. You got George Pickens getting talked to by Mike Tomlin on the sideline, trying to tell him to grow up and show more maturity. But how can you not be frustrated if you're George Pickens? Because you're the most talented wide receiver on the team. You specialize in 50-50 balls, and yet the offense, for some reason, can't find a way to get them to you. I'm, I'm so sick and tired of watching this team play. Every time I watch the Steelers play, they make my blood pressure go up. It's so stressful when you watch this team because they're all defense. They got no offense. If you watch college football, the Pittsburgh Steelers are the equivalent to the Iowa Hawkeyes. The only way this offense can put up some damn points is if they get a big play on the run game. Or if they're able to get a big play on special teams or a turnover on defense. That's it. The defense and the special teams are the best offense. I can't believe the Steelers really allowed New England to win this game. And you, I, I shouldn't be surprised. I know I shouldn't be surprised. This is the same team that lost to Arizona last week. Talking about some redemption. Yeah, your redemption was losing to the fucking Patriots? The Mike Tomlin fan club, it needs to be this bad. If you're still making excuses for Mike Tomlin at this point, then I really don't want to hear anything else that you have to say because you clearly don't have the ability to take your bias aside and your love for Mike Tomlin out of the equation. Mike Tomlin's not a bad football coach. He's one of the best coaches in the NFL. But we can all agree that his time in Pittsburgh is now starting to come to an end. Same thing that what happened to Andy Reid when he was with the Philadelphia Eagles and Tony Dungy with the Tempe Buccaneers decades ago. There's no reason why Mike Tomlin needs to return to Pittsburgh in 2024. This dude, he, he's like expired milk. You left him in the back of the refrigerator for too long and now he's spoiled. I'm sick and tired of the whole excuses that people make about Mike Tomlin. Well, Kenny Pickett is injured. Even when Kenny Pickett was healthy, they were still playing down the competition. It's been the same bull jockey out of this team under Mike Tomlin's coaching for years. Years. You remember when we lost to Tim Tebow in a wild card round? I'm sick and tired of this crap, man. I am. And I'm sick and tired of the people who continue to defend Mike Tomlin, bruh. Why can't we just be honest? You lose to Arizona and you lose to the Patriots. Back to back weeks, the Steelers have lost to two of the worst teams in the NFL, man. Make it make sense, bro. You can't keep defending mediocrity. You can't. Especially when you have a head coach who goes up there in his press conference and always preaches how the standard is the standard. And the standard should never change. Well, the standard has changed a lot over the last couple years in Pittsburgh under Mike Tomlin. This used to be a team that was always in the Super Bowl conversation. And you always expected for the Steelers to win a Super Bowl every single year. And you never sounded crazy for saying that. But now, the standard in Pittsburgh is being okay with going 9-8, and eight, maybe making it to the first round of playoffs, and getting your ass beat and sent home. When is the standard 
going to go back to what it used to be. Winning championships, prioritizing, at least making it deep in the playoffs to the conference championship game. When are the Steelers going to get back to that level? You know, I've been a Steelers fan since I was in second grade. I'm about to graduate college in a couple of months. And all I've seen this franchise do is go from one of the best in the NFL, being a championship contender year after year, to being a team that's okay with going 9-8 and eight and not having a losing season. Fuck that. I'd rather have a couple of losing seasons and win a championship than continue to overachieve relative to most people's expectations and go 9-8 and eight every season and lose in the first round. That's not Steelers football. That's not what the standard used to be. The standard went from this to this. It's the new standard in Pittsburgh being okay with losing in back-to-back weeks to two of the NFL's worst teams? No more excuses for Mike Tomlin. Meanwhile, for New England, Bailey Zappi, it looks like you have a quarterback that's good enough to be your backup for next season when you end up finding a replacement for Mac Jones. Bailey Zappi, he played really well in the first half. In the second half, he didn't play too bad. The Steelers' defense started to tee off. But you look at Ezekiel Elliott, we definitely saw some flashes of vintage Zeke. He had a big touchdown catch. He also had a couple of really impressive runs, even though they weren't any big runs for like 40, 50 yards. But you still saw a little bit of glimpse of what Ezekiel Elliott used to be when he was playing at his best with the Dallas Cowboys. He had a really good performance tonight. And New England's offensive line, you got to give them credit. They pretty much held their own against a really good pass rush for the majority of this game. Yeah, of course, Pittsburgh got honed a couple of times, but some of those sacks that they got on Bailey Zappi were due to the Steelers sending extra pressure. And they were absolutely making a mockery of the Steelers linebackers and their secondary. I mean, these linebackers, look, I get that the Steelers are battered right now at that position, but damn. Hunter Henry had two touchdowns. What a perfect birthday present. Allow him to get two touchdowns on a terrible group of linebackers. Whoa, well, way to go, Mike Tomlin. Way to go. I guess that was Mike Tomlin's birthday present to Hunter Henry. Allow him just to get easy touchdowns on a poorest group of linebackers. Not just are these linebackers terrible at covering tight ends, but they were terrible stopping these running backs out of the backfield also. Like, the secondary, they gave up a big play early to Juju Smith-Schuster. The only thing the Steelers' defense has going for it is that great pass rush. And Alex Highsmith had to leave this game for neck injury, and we don't know how long he's going to be out. And TJ Watt, we pretty much didn't hear too much of his name being called tonight prior to, you know, the second half in the third quarter. That was about it. I am really disappointed to call myself a Steelers fan right now because we're just okay with mediocrity. We we are just going to be okay with continuing to make excuses for a head coach who has now lost two straight games to the worst teams in the NFL. We are okay with a head coach who's never had a winning record but hasn't been to a Super Bowl in over a decade, who lost to Tim Tebow in a wild card round in overtime? I'm so disappointed And what I saw out of the Pittsburgh Steelers tonight. This is not Pittsburgh Steelers football. And the standard is the standard. No, it's not Mike Tomlin. The new standard for the Pittsburgh Steelers is losing to the Cardinals and the Patriots. And being okay with going 9-8 and every season. That's the new standard, Mike Tomlin. It's crazy how he always preaches about mediocrity isn't acceptable. When all we've been accepting over the last decade from him is mediocrity. We went from... Winning Super Bowls, being a championship contender every single season, to going downhill ever since we lost to the Denver Broncos and Tim Tebow. The closest the Steelers have ever come to making it to the Super Bowl was in the AFC Championship, what, 2016, 2017, when they got clobbered by Tom Brady and Bill Belichick? Bill Belichick always has the coaching advantage anytime he goes up against Mike Tomlin. 
And I took the Patriots to cover in this game. I didn't think they would win. I thought the Steelers would be able to pull it out because I didn't think that Bailey Zappi would start this game off as hot as what he did. He was moving the football up and down on the Steelers' defense with ease. And a large reason for it is because the secondary can't cover nobody. The linebackers can't cover no tight ends or the running backs. Huh. I need one of those terrible towels because I need to wipe my face with all this sweat that I have right now from watching this abysmal performance out of a team that now has become the mediocrity of the AFC North. The Bengals have been to the Super Bowl recently. The Ravens look like they're on the trajectory of making it to the Super Bowl eventually with Lamar Jackson and the Browns. They beat the Steelers in the playoffs. Y'all y'all remember that? Y'all remember when Kevin Stefanski wasn't able to coach that wild card round game and he was out with COVID and Mike Tomlin lost to an interim head coach? I mean, the Steelers now went from a first-class organization to a B-tier organization. And this loss just is the epitome of everything that the Steelers have been over the last couple of years under Mike Tomlin. If this game wasn't the final warning sign that the Steelers need to move on, then I don't know what else is. If you continue to make excuses for Mike Tomlin, then you continue to be okay with mediocrity. You are okay with the new standard being 9-8 and eight and being okay with maybe making it into the wild card round and getting your ass kicked in the first round and getting put on the couch right after. This team is not the same organization that I grew up rooting for when I first started watching the Pittsburgh Steelers. I remember this team being all about gritty, being all about coming up in the big moments, always being ready to play, being physical. I didn't see any of that tonight in this loss to the New England Patriots. And I'm incredibly irritated right now at the fact that I still see people making excuses for Mike Tomlin retaining his job. I'm done with Mike Tomlin. I really am. I wasn't expecting for Pittsburgh to make it to the play to the playoffs this year. Hell, I didn't even have them in the postseason. I had them going nine and eight. And everybody started coming at me saying, Oh, JT, you're such a Mike Tomlin hater. Oh my God. Our team is not that bad. Well, how do you feel about it now? We just lost back to back. We're seven and six. We're not making it to the playoffs, people. Get the playoffs out of your head. At this point, I want, us to, I want us to lose as many games as possible so we can put ourselves in position to get a high draft pick in the first round of next year's draft if we have one so we can draft another quarterback and hopefully we have a new head coach who's in the driver's seat making that decision. I never wanted Kenny Pickett. Yeah, I was wrong about wanting Malik Willis instead, but he's still no better. Not that much. I mean, Malik Willis isn't a starter in this league, but Kenny Pickett, he's, he's like one of those quarterbacks that's a backup, but he's only a starter because where he was drafted at. If Kenny Pickett was playing for the majority of any other NFL teams out there, he wouldn't be a starter. He's a quality backup at best. Even with the new offensive coordinator, Kenny Pickett still isn't that good. Yeah, he's played better over the last couple of weeks. But he's still not good enough to lead the Steelers to the Super Bowl. You look at this division. You got Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson, Deshaun Watson, if he ever bounces back and gets back to the form that he used to play at when he was with Houston. The Steelers have the worst quarterback in this division. You went from a Hall of Famer and Ben Roethlisberger to having the worst quarterback in the toughest division in the NFL. There was no way that the Steelers ever had a chance at making it to the playoffs this year. Not with how tough this division is. And when Joe Burrow comes back next year, I'm going to be right again. When I tell you guys that the offensive coordinator isn't going to make Kenny Pickett go from a below average starter to a middle of the pack quarterback, that's not going to happen. Now, even though I don't like Kenny Pickett all that much as a player, I really do love him as a person. And I would have loved to see him play tonight if he was healthy because Mr. Trubisky is terrible. And for all you people who thought that Trubisky couldn't be any worse than Kenny Pickett, well, you were wrong because he was a lot worse than Kenny Pickett. I'll take Kenny Pickett over Mitch Trubisky and Mason Rudolph any day of the week. And then you had Steeler fans booing Mitch Trubisky. They wanted to see Mason Rudolph. And hell, I wanted to see Mason Rudolph. Although Mason Rudolph wouldn't have been any better neither. 
The last time we saw Mason Rudolph starting a few games for Pittsburgh, he was just as bad as Mitch Trubisky. Plus, he can't run. That's the only thing that Mr. Trubisky can do, run the football. You know what the Steelers should have done this game? They should have ran Mr. Trubisky at least 15, 20 times in this game. That's the only way Trubisky could effectively move the football when he was utilizing his legs. I don't even know what to say anymore, man. All I got to say is I'm ready for some change. And if you're not ready for change, then you're part of the reason why Mike Tomlin is still allowed to be the head coach of Pittsburgh and why people in the national media continue to ride this dude's you-know-what. Mike Tomlin is overrated. Yeah, he's a top-five head coach, but there are a lot of games where he doesn't look like a top-five head coach. And you can say, oh, JT, you're lucky to have Mike Tomlin. I'll take Mike Tomlin as our head coach in a heartbeat. Yeah, you're saying that if you're a Chargers fan or if you're a Saints fan, and that's cool. But as a Steeler fan, we need some damn change. We need, a, we need a new head coach in here ASAP, expeditiously, man. Go out there and find somebody who can replace Mike Tomlin. Give us a Lou Anarumo. Give us whoever is the offensive coordinator of the Detroit Lions. Just somebody. I just need to see a new face in there other than Mr. Raw Raw Mike Tomlin. I can't believe the Steelers literally had the audacity to lose to New England tonight. Yeah, the Patriots got a great defense, but you didn't expect for your special teams and defense to be the only reason that you were able to get into the red zone in this game pretty much. Unacceptable. I'm tired of Mike Tomlin defenders. I'm tired of the Mike Tomlin fanboys. You need to disband and find another head coach to fanboy because Mike Tomlin is not the one you want to fanboy when you're losing two straight weeks to the worst teams in the NFL. Unacceptable. The standard is not the standard, Mike Tomlin. The standard is 9-8. Losing to Arizona and New England and being okay with making it to a wild card berth and getting your ass kicked. Boy, the Colorado haters were mad about this one. The Buffs get a big time commitment from five star offensive tackle Jordan Seaton. And this is a huge time acquisition by Colorado. Now, of course, none of this is official until he signs his name on the dotted line on early national signing day. But this is a huge get for Deion Sanders, and they desperately needed this because this offensive line was terrible this past season. It was so bad that Shadur Sanders ended up getting injured against Washington State, and now you have a guy who should be able to come in and be a day one starter right away on your offensive line. Now, he played left tackle for his final season at IMG, and he also has the ability to play offensive guard as well but you got a really athletic offensive tackle that has great size he's 6'5 287 pounds incredible athleticism great footwork really quick on his feet has good change of direction and you want to know what else would make this commitment even sweeter what if Colorado can flip Oregon commit I'm trying to figure out his name Jaquan McRoy now, Jaquan McRoy, Colorado has been really hot on his trail over the last couple of weeks. He recently took an official visit to Colorado not too long ago. He enjoyed his time with the Buffs and Coach Prime's coaching staff. And if they can not only get Jordan Seaton, but Jaquan McRoy, and they can flip him from Oregon, you feel really good about how Colorado's offensive line is going to look going into 2024. And Jordan Seaton is a dog. He's the number one offensive tackle in this recruiting cycle. But I think that Jaquan McRoy is better than him. He's 6'8", 365 pounds, and he's also a good athlete. But when you got this kind of size, 6'8", 365, moving like the way Jaquan McRoy is, you got to go ahead and get that if you're Deion Sanders because then you will have – Two guys who could come in and immediately improve your offensive line as soon as they walk on campus. So, Jordan Seaton, you commit to Colorado. Now are you going to be down to put in the work that it takes to be great under Coach Prime? Because he expects a lot out of these five-star recruits that he brings in. He holds them to a higher standard than he does everybody else. When you commit to Colorado, you're committing to the grind. You're committing to getting put through 
the ringer that Coach Ron, that Coach Prime is going to put you through over the next couple of months during the offseason. And I've seen a lot of haters say that, oh, he made a terrible mistake. He's going to transfer from Colorado after the season ends. I mean, if he does, then he wasn't the dog that Deion Sanders probably thought that he was. Because if he's a dog, then there's no reason why he shouldn't be able to succeed in Colorado. Look, the offensive line was terrible. They should be able to start this dude right away, and he should be better than whoever else they had at left tackle or right tackle, whichever offensive tackle spot he starts at this year. And like I said, I would love for them to get Jaquan McRoy. If you could get Jaquan McRoy and Jordan Seaton, this recruiting class looks really impressive. Even if you don't finish in the top 25, you were able to snag two of the best offensive tackles in the 2024 high school class. And you're going to have two guys who could come in and start for you right away. And with this commitment from Jordan Seaton, you wonder if that's going to motivate Jaquan McRoy even more to want to flip from Oregon to Colorado. But the haters were really mad about this one. But... I would be mad too if I wasn't a fan of Colorado and I was an Alabama or a Tennessee fan because it didn't seem like a lot of people had a lot of confidence that he was going to go to Colorado. But as we've seen Deion Sanders do the previous two years, he flipped Cormani McLean. Nobody saw that one come and flip Cormani from Miami to Boulder. He also did the same thing with Travis Hunter flipping him from Florida State to Jackson State, and there was a lot of outrage when those two commitments took place. So it's no surprise that the Coach Prime haters out there are trying to find ways to bring this young man down, going on his pace, saying, you made a terrible decision. Like, this dude made a great decision. He went to a place that he feels is going to be able to get the best out of him, and plus he's going to have a great chance at starting day one. If Jordan Cian can't start day one, I'm going to be really concerned about how good this dude actually is because Colorado's offensive line was trash last year. It was a tragedy. And plus, you're going to couple that with a really good Juco offensive line commit that you also have coming in and Isaiah Walker Jr., who's going to be probably starting on the interior of the offensive line, either at one of those two guard spots. I really love this addition of Jordan Seaton to this recruiting class. And hopefully, this falls through. I saw something that said that Oregon is still going to be hot on his trail. They're still going to be trying to flip him. He's set to still make a visit to Eugene. But hopefully he honors his word. He signs on the dotted line with Coach Prime in the buffs. And we can get this dude in a Colorado Buffalo uniform in 2024. Because this dude is going to have a massive impact on Colorado being able to make a lot of noise in 2024. Like Coach Prime said, we're not coming anymore. We're here, and we're about to kick the door down, man. And Coach Prime said that they're only seven, eight dogs away from getting to the level that they want to be at in order to compete for championships. And this dude is one of those eight dogs that Dion said that he needed. The offensive line, we knew that had to be addressed this offseason. And Dion Sanders... In a recent interview that he did with 247 Sports, you can go watch it. It's on their YouTube channel. He said that they definitely are putting a lot of focus on improving the offensive line because Shadur Sanders not only is his quarterback, but it's his son as well. And he wants his son to be healthy, not just for next season, but for the future of his football career when he eventually ends up getting drafted in the first round and he's playing in the National Football League. So Jordan is seeing... Big time pickup for Coach Prime in the Buffs. Nothing is official until these guys sign on the dotted line, but I'm pretty confident that this dude is going to honor his commitment. I couldn't see Oregon flipping this dude that fast with National Signing Day just around the corner. I expect this dude to be playing for the Buffs in 2024, and I'm really excited about him. And he reminds me a lot of Trent Williams, which is high praise, and I'm not saying that he's as good as what Trent Williams is right now, but he has a lot of similarities to him. Great size. He's only going to get bigger. He's 287 pounds. By the time next season starts, he'll probably be around 305. And you couple that with his athleticism and space. If he gets his hands on you and you're a defensive back or a linebacker, you better watch out because he's about to put you on your ass. I'm so happy that Jordan Seaton committed to Colorado. This was something that Colorado needed to address. 
And they addressed it in a big time way, getting somebody who not only is going to be somebody who can come in and produce for you right away, but he also is a recruit that maybe he can influence other offensive linemen to want to commit to Colorado. If you're an offensive lineman like Jaquan McRoy and you see Jordan seeing the number one offensive tackle in your class commit, you're probably like, damn, if he's going to Colorado, hell, maybe I should give Colorado another look and maybe I should take my talents there and we could build up a great offensive line. And you see, the transfer portal can only improve the offensive line so much. You also have to bring in recruits. And you got to couple that with transfer portal, guys, and you got to make sure that you can get the communication right. You just can't assemble a team all through the transfer portal. You got to be able to hit the recruiting trail pretty hard. And Coach Prime and his staff, they did that. And they put a lot of work in trying to get Jordan Seaton to commit to Colorado. They've been on this dude's trail for the last couple of months. He's been one of the biggest stories that I've been keeping up with when it comes to Colorado recruiting. And I don't really pay too much attention to recruiting like that. So the fact that I'm even talking about this shows you just how significant of a commitment this is for Coach Prime and the Buffs. But let me know your thoughts on this commitment down in the comment section down below. And what are your expectations for Jordan Seaton if he does honor his commitment and signs with the Buffs? Marvin Harrison Jr. is undecided about his football future. He doesn't know if he's going to declare for the 2024 NFL Draft or if he's going to run it back for another season with... Ohio State and the report circulating around is that Marvin Harrison he doesn't really feel complete about what he's accomplished up to this point in his Buckeye career he still wants to beat Michigan something that he hasn't had the luxury of being able to get done and he wants to win the Big Ten championship and listen if Marvin Harrison Jr. decides to return to Ohio State for one more season I don't think it would be a bad move. You got people out there that make it seem like this dude has to enter the NFL draft so he doesn't get injured potentially and risk his draft stock dropping. Like, listen, Marvin Harrison Jr. is one of the greatest wide receiver prospects ever. Even if he does suffer a devastating injury, if he was to return to Ohio State for another season, I don't think he will fall out the first round. And plus, you already know if he comes back for another year, Ohio State is definitely going to make sure that this dude is well taken care of. They already have a high NIL package set in place for Marvin Harrison Jr. if he returns. And I would love to see him play one more year for the Buckeyes. I think it's better when you think about how short life is, to go ahead and try to accomplish everything that you want to accomplish, and you don't want to leave anything on the table. If you're Marvin Harrison Jr., even if you have a Hall of Fame career in the NFL, you don't want to look back and say, damn, like, I wish I would have stayed for one more season at Ohio State. Maybe we could have had the chance to beat Michigan. Maybe we could have won the conference. You know, there's a lot of things that Marvin Harrison Jr. personally wants to accomplish. He doesn't have to enter the NFL draft. Yeah, he probably would be passing up on some big time money, but I'm pretty sure that anything that they offer him from an NIO standpoint is going to be just as good as what he will make his rookie season. Well, JT, he'll hold back the clock on his second contract extension. Okay, cool. This dude obviously doesn't care about the money like that. He obviously cares more about bringing the championship and bringing back the rivalry to Ohio State and putting it in their favor than he does caring about being a high first-round draft pick in the league and making millions of dollars. His dude, his dad, his pops, Marvin Harrison, is a Hall of Famer. He's well taken care of when it comes to financial compensation. This is somebody that takes a lot of pride in being a Buckeye, and that's why he's so split on this decision. And can you really fault the kid? For being this dedicated to a school that he decided to invest his next couple of years of his life to play for? You really can't. Like, you, if anything, I would love to see this dude back for the Buckeyes in 2024. I think this is what college football needs. You see, in college football, it seems like all people care about is money, trying to start, and nobody really has a lot of strong ties towards their school. When you watch those Michigan players play against Ohio State, not only do you see a really physical football team, but you see a team that plays with a lot of love and passion for the University of Michigan. Ohio State 
You need a guy like a Marvin Harrison Jr. to be on your roster when you're going against Michigan because you need that leadership. You need somebody who's sick and tired of getting ran out the building by Michigan. You need somebody that's tired of Michigan running all over them and is tired of taking L's to their rival. This is somebody that eats, sleeps, and breathes Ohio State. This is the kind of player that you want in your program. And it also will look good on Ryan Day if Marvin Harrison Jr. comes back because that shows you that his program is so well built that a guy like Marvin Harrison, that's one of the most talented wide receiver prospects to ever play football, decides to forego being a top five pick in the NFL draft potentially to come back for one more season because he just wants to beat Ohio State so bad and he wants to bring a Big Ten championship and a natty to his school. I don't have nothing but respect for Marvin Harrison Jr. if he decides to come back for another season. I don't see how you could scrutinize or criticize that kid for doing that, even if he does get injured. Hell, if you're Marvin Harrison Jr., you'd rather get injured trying to accomplish your goals rather with living with years of regret after for not going back even though you really wanted to because people made it seem like you had to declare for the NFL draft. This dude obviously doesn't care about the money. This dude cares more about bringing relevance and glory back to Ohio State than he does about being a top five draft pick. And plus, who would want to play for the Chicago Bears if they wanted to draft him first overall? I wouldn't. If anything, I would have no problem going back for another season if I had to risk getting drafted by Chicago. That's one of the worst franchises in the NFL right now. I wouldn't want to play for them. Marvin Harrison, if he does decide to declare for the NFL draft, he arguably is the most talented player in the 2024 draft class, not named Caleb Williams. And some may argue and say that he's talented or more talented than what Caleb Williams is, and he's the number one player overall. Now, that's a debate for another day. But Marvin Harrison Jr., I don't think that he's making the wrong decision with anything that he decides to do. If he wants to run it back one more time with Ohio State, there's nothing wrong with that. Even if he does get injured, he's still going to be a first-round pick. Him suffering a devastating ACL injury or Achilles injury still wouldn't scare teams off from drafting him in the first round just because of how talented he is. He has incredible speed. He clocked in at 22, 23 miles per hour this past season. He has great hands. He's a fantastic route runner. Great after the catch. Great size. Everything that you want in a wide receiver prospect and then some you have in Marvin Harrison Jr., the NFL is always going to be there for Marvin Harrison Jr. And teams are still going to be waiting to draft him high in the top 10, top 5 of the draft, regardless of what happens to him in 2024 if he goes back. But if he does declare for the draft, then he possibly is going to be a top 5 selection. He could be one of the highest drafted wide receivers that we've seen in recent memory. He's that good that he could get taken number 1 overall and nobody have a problem with it. If Marvin Harrison Jr. was in the NFL right now, he possibly would be a top five, top 10 wide receiver. That's how good this dude is. So any decision that Marvin Harrison Jr. decides to make, I don't think he could go wrong. Yeah, you got the injury concerns, but at the end of the day, I'd rather go out trying to accomplish my goals versus living with regret two, three decades later down the road and saying, damn, like, I wish I could have had the opportunity to give it one more crack to give Ohio State a Big Ten championship and a win over Michigan and change the course of that rivalry. The college football season is pretty much in the books, but transfer portal season is just starting to heat up. And I'm going to be giving you guys my predictions for where I feel the top quarterbacks in the transfer portal are going to land. We're going to start off with Cam Ward. He entered the transfer portal. He's transferring from Washington State. I got him going to Ohio State. Kyle McCord just hit the portal. Cam Ward, he fits the bill for what Ryan Day wants out of his quarterbacks. He has great size, a strong arm, really accurate in the short intermediate passing game. And he possibly could be the second best quarterback that Ryan Day has had. Behind C.J. Stroud, I would take Cameron Ward over Justin Fields. He's a more polished passer. He's better at reading defenses than what Justin Fields was during his time at Ohio State. And he would be a tremendous upgrade over Kyle McCord. 
Cam Ward, if you're looking for a staff that can develop you and help you become a first-round draft pick, Ohio State is the place to go. You're going to be playing in the toughest conference or one of the toughest conferences in college football. You're going to get coached by one of the best offensive minds in the sport. I just think that him going to Ohio State makes perfect sense. You know that the money's going to be there for him as well. There was some report saying that he's looking for a $1 million NIL deal. If that is true, you definitely can be assured that he's going to receive that with Ohio State. Plus, you're going to have one of the best rosters in America. You're also going to have a talented group of wide receivers to throw the football to. This is a perfect situation for Cam Ward to not only get a lot of money, but in the process, he can improve his draft stock and potentially be a first-round pick in the 2025 NFL Draft. Dante Moore, he was a highly talented quarterback in last year's recruiting cycle. He ended up flipping from Oregon to play for Chip Kelly and UCLA, and it didn't work out so well for him. I believe that Wisconsin would be a great place for him. A lot of you guys are probably going to disagree with that. You're going to be like, JT, Wisconsin? Why the hell would he play for Wisconsin? Well, Wisconsin, when they hire Lou Fickle, Luke Fickle, he changed his offensive philosophy. Now they run the air raid style offense. And Dante Moore... If you're looking for a school that you can transfer to and have the opportunity to start right away, Wisconsin is definitely the place to do that at. And Dante Moore, he has a lot of potential. Yeah, he looked really bad his true freshman season at UCLA, but how much of that was due to Dante Moore just not being that great and Chip Kelly just losing a little bit of his touch when it comes to his play calling on offense? I would say it was a conservative effort. Dante Moore is a really good athlete, has a great arm, and when he was coming out of high school, I thought that he was a bigger version of Bryce Young or Russell Wilson. You give him to Luke Fickle behind a really good Wisconsin offensive line, an improved group of wide receivers because Wisconsin also is going to improve the wide receiving corps as well. This is going to be a really good offense, and with Dante Moore at the helm, they possibly could be a sleeper pick to win the Big Ten next year. They're going to have a great defense. All they really need is a quarterback. They had Tanner Mordecai, who they picked up out of the transfer portal last year. He dealt with some injuries this season. Dante Moore, if you can bring this kid in and you can give him the proper coaching and development that he needs, he's good enough to have Wisconsin competing for the top of the Big Ten. For you to be able to win in the Big Ten in 2024, you're going to need good quarterback play. And Dante Moore definitely could give that to Wisconsin. Luke Fickle has a pretty good coaching staff. All they really need is a quarterback. And with the upside and potential that Dante Moore has, I don't see why you wouldn't take a gamble on that if you're Luke Fickle. And Dante Moore, why go to a school like Ohio State where you may have to compete for the starting job, where you go to Wisconsin, that thing is pretty much given to you. Next up, I got Will Howard. I have him transferring to my Miami Hurricanes. I would love to see Will Howard playing for the Hurricanes. Tyler Van Dyke was previously the starter for Miami at QB, and he was really inconsistent. Will Howard has been the starting quarterback of Kansas State for the previous two years. He led them to the Big 12 title in 2022, and he has a lot of similarities to Dak Prescott. He has a pretty good arm. He makes really smart decisions with the football. There was a stretch during this season when he was a little bit streaky, and they ended up running a two-quarterback system with him and this other freshman quarterback that they had. But he still got the majority of the snaps. And during the second half of the season, he played a lot better than what he did early on during the season. Miami, you need a quarterback that can take care of the football. Mario Cristobal doesn't need nothing flashy. He doesn't need a Dante Moore. He doesn't need a Riley Leonard. He doesn't need a true dual threat quarterback. Will Howard, he is a dual threat. And when you look at his rushing numbers, they really are surprising. He also has a couple of touchdowns on the ground that he scored this past year. And when you look at him and his playing style, you would think that he's one of those traditional drop back pocket passer quarterbacks. But he's actually pretty good when he decides to tuck the football and run. He just isn't a quarterback that's going to have blazing 40, 50 yards downfield or blazing 40, 50 yard runs downfield when he's going to be burning defenders. He's one of those guys that he has enough mobility to pick up. 
10, maybe 15 yards if you give him a run lane and he can make you pay. But overall, you got a really solid quarterback that has experience being a starter. He's played in big games. This is a perfect fit for Mario Cristobal and the Miami Hurricanes. And they also got the money to make it happen. They got one of the richest NIL donors in all of college football. So there's no reason why this realistically doesn't have a chance at happening. Now, he's also been linked to USC and Lincoln Riley. But I think that they got another good quarterback Lurking in the wings, I just think it makes more sense for him to go to Miami. This is a school that desperately needs a quarterback. And Miami, to me, is a quarterback away from being a contender for the ACC next season. So if they can get Will Howard, he would be a great addition for the Canes. The Canes got a pretty good offensive line. They got a young, talented group of wide receivers that needs to be more consistent. But overall, he will have all the pieces necessary to be successful. And Shannon Dawson is a pretty good offensive coordinator. I think him and the Hurricanes would be a perfect fit. Dylan Gabriel... He transferred out of Oklahoma, which was really surprising to me because, yeah, he would have been in a quarterback battle, but I still believe that he would have won it out due to how well he's played this season for Oklahoma. He can be a little streaky at times, but this is one of the better quarterbacks in college football, and he recently took a visit to Oregon. A lot of reports say that he most likely is going to transfer to Oregon, and I have him projected to go to Oregon myself. You look at how good of a staff Dan Lanning has assembled on the offensive side of the football. Will Stein is one of the best up-and-coming offensive minds in the game. He probably is going to be a head coach sooner rather than later. Dylan Gabriel had a really good season with Oklahoma when, at one point, he was a Heisman candidate. So you put them on Oregon with how deep they are at wide receiver and how good their offensive line is, you feel really good about their chances of them being able to get into the 12-team college football playoffs in 2024. And he's one of the best quarterbacks out there. He's a top three quarterback in the transfer portal, in my opinion. I don't think there's too many quarterbacks in the portal right now that have the kind of resume and track record that Dylan Gabriel has, not just dating back to his tenure with Oklahoma, but he also was really good for UCF. And if my memory serves me correctly, he came in when Mackenzie Milton went down with the major injury and he was even better than what Milton was at one point, in my opinion. So Dylan Gabriel going to Oregon, that would be a huge pickup for Dan Lennon and his staff and it would be a perfect fit. And I don't get why he transferred out of Oklahoma. Brent Venables even said that you know, he was welcome to stay. Yeah, he would have had to compete, but I would have felt pretty confident about him winning the starting job just based on what he's done, being able to lead Oklahoma to big wins. And this is the best season that Oklahoma has had in the last couple of years. And Dylan Gabriel was a big catalyst for it. I got him going to Oregon. Aiden Childs, he originally committed to Jonathan Smith in last year's recruiting cycle to Oregon State. Jonathan Smith is now with Michigan State. So it only makes sense for Aiden Childs to transfer to Michigan State along with Jonathan Smith. This dude, I watched him in the spring game. We didn't really see too much of him during the regular season for Oregon State because DJ Uyunglele was the starting quarterback. But when I watched him play in the spring game last year, this dude was really impressive. Great athleticism, really good at extending plays. He has a live arm. I'm betting a lot of money that he probably follows Jonathan Smith in Michigan State. I can't really see him going elsewhere. Riley Leonard, Notre Dame has been the popular landing spot for him. That's where I got him going also. I don't think he's too much better than what Sam Hartman is. He has a really good arm. He isn't the greatest passer. You know, he's not a bad passer, but I do think that he needs to be a little bit more refined if he wants to end up being a high draft pick in the NFL. And going to Notre Dame definitely could help him accomplish that. They got a pretty good staff there. He, of course, he's going to be throwing behind one of the best offensive lines in college football. And they got a lot of talent at wide receiver that a lot of people don't know about. Riley Leonard, he also is a really good athlete, so he's going to be an upgrade from Sam Hartman in that department. Sam Hartman, yeah, he was able to pick up a couple of yards here and there with his legs, but Riley Leonard, he's a really incredible dual threat quarterback, one of the best in college football when he's fully healthy. Plus, he has good size, so you can use him on 
design quarterback sneaks. If you want to do the tush push on the goal line, if you want to do quarterback power with Raleigh Leonard, you can do that also. Zone reads, read options. Raleigh Leonard would tremendously open up that Notre Dame playbook and he will bring a different dimension to that offense that they haven't had in a very long time. He probably will be the most athletic quarterback that they've had since who? Ian, Ian Book? And Ian Book wasn't even all that and wasn't even all that athletic. So you get Raleigh Leonard in there. I think that Notre Dame, they possibly would be just as good next season as what they were this past season with Sam Hartman at quarterback. Maybe even better with you with the upside that you get out of Raleigh Leonard when it comes to what he can do on the ground. And plus, this is somebody that isn't a finished product. He isn't somebody that's been in college football for 100 years like how Sam Hartman is. So there's still a lot of room to develop for him. He's going to Notre Dame. That's my prediction. Kyle McCord, I got him going to Nebraska. Matt Rule said that it costs a million dollars to get a top-end quarterback in the transfer portal. And I'm pretty sure that they're not going to have the kind of money necessary, necessary to get a Cam Ward or a Will Howard. But Kyle McCord... Wouldn't it be too bad of a pickup for the Cornhuskers? I think that he is a little bit overhated. Yeah, he wasn't as good as what the past Buckeye quarterbacks have been. C.J. Stroud, Justin Fields all have been miles better than Kyle McCord. Can't forget about Dwayne Haskins also, but he wasn't terrible. He led, he led Ohio State to a game-winning drive against Notre Dame on the road. Against Michigan, yeah, he wasn't good, but... You know, you can't put all of that Ohio State loss on him. Well, that Michigan loss on him, excuse me, because the offensive line didn't really do him any favors. Going to Nebraska gives him a chance to reset his career. He's going to have a new coaching staff, a pretty solid coaching staff. I don't think Nebraska's offensive coordinator is bad. It's just that the quarterback situation that they held, they had to deal with last year was terrible. You had Jeff Sims. You had a couple of other guys who you were throwing in there. You just couldn't find any consistency there. Kyle McCord, he wouldn't be good enough to get Nebraska to the Big Ten Championship, but he would be good enough to have Nebraska bowl eligible. I think Kyle McCord is a pretty solid athlete. You know, he's not a dynamic runner with the ball, but he can move around, extend plays here and there, maybe pick up five, six yards on the ground when things break down. And, you know, his decision making isn't that bad neither. He does need a little bit more work when it comes to being more proficient as a passer. But with Nebraska, I think that this is a match made in heaven. You got a chance to turn around the program that's been down for the last couple of years. The expectations aren't going to be that high. When you're playing at a school like Ohio State, there's a certain level of play that Buckeye fans expect from you. And Kyle McCord, when you look at his stats from 2023 this past season, they're not that bad. Most quarterbacks that throw 20-plus touchdowns, you will view them as one of the better QBs in college football. But with the fact that Kyle McCord didn't play well against Michigan and he's at a school like Ohio State that consistently gets high-level quarterback play, it was going to be pretty hard for him to live up to the high expectations that C.J. Stroud left. And it was going to be hard for him to fill those shoes. So going to a school like Nebraska where the expectations aren't that high and the attention isn't really that big, neither when you think about where Nebraska has been as a football program, that's the perfect place for Kyle McCord to resume his college football career. And this dude isn't bad, okay? He's not trash. He's not terrible. He's not great. But I would take Kyle McCord over a handful of other quarterbacks out there that have been starting in the Big Ten this year. This conference has had some of the worst quarterback play in all of college football this past season you bring in Kyle McCord this dude is probably a top four top five quarterback at minimum in the conference going into 2024 Will Rogers I got him going to Washington playing for head coach Kalen DeBoer he has a lot of familiarity with Kalen DeBoer's system he has spent the last couple of years starting for Mississippi State, and he has been one of the best quarterbacks in the SEC 
ever since he first took over at the helm at QB for Mike Leach before he unfortunately passed away. He has a lot of production, over 12,000 passing yards, 94 touchdowns, only 28 interceptions, three-year starter. So you're going to have somebody who can come in, fill the shoes of Michael Penix perfectly because you're going to have the experience. You're going to have somebody that has been in big games. And this is going to be the best situation that Will Rogers has ever had. He's never had the team as talented as what he potentially could be inheriting if he were to transfer to Washington State. You're also going to have a great coaching staff. Their offensive coordinator is really good also. Nick Saban wanted their offensive coordinator, but he ended up going back to Washington. So Will Rogers, he will be receiving top-notch coaching, and it could be good enough to improve his draft stock. If he were to declare for the NFL draft right now, he probably would be a six or seven round selection. Going to a school like Washington where they're really deep at wide receiver, they got a good offensive line and the coaching is going to be top notch, will be a great place for him to put himself in that first round conversation because I like Will Rogers' game. He's not really super athletic, but he has a good arm. I think he's pretty accurate with the football and playing for Kalen DeBoer is going to be able to bring the best out of him. I think that this is a perfect match. Will Rogers in Washington. Daquan Finn... Probably one of the more underrated quarterback names in the transfer portal that not too many people know about. But if you were to watch him play for Toledo over the last couple of weeks, over the last couple of years, this dude is probably one of the best G5 quarterbacks in college football. And he's the best G5 quarterback in the portal right now. And I would take him over Grayson McCall at Toledo. He had 22 touchdowns, nine interceptions in 2023. He led them to the MAC championship. He also is a dynamic athlete with the ball in his hands. He had 563 rushing yards and nine touchdowns on the ground. And he's rumored to where to run somewhere between a 4-3 and a 4-4. Going to Hugh Freeze at Auburn, where they desperately need a good quarterback. Payton Thorne, he's not it. Robbie Ashford, he doesn't look like he's going to be it neither. You give you Freeze a guy with the talent of the Quan Finn, and Auburn potentially could make a lot of noise next season with this dude at quarterback. Not a lot of people know how good this dude truly is because he played in the MAC. And let's be honest, unless you're a fan of one of those MAC teams, you weren't really paying a lot of attention to the Quan Finn. But if you watch this dude's highlights, he's one of the most dynamic quarterbacks in college football, and he reminds me a lot of Malik Cunningham. For those of you guys who remember Malik Cunningham at Louisville, he was Lamar Jackson's replacement when he declared for the draft, and he had a pretty good career at Louisville. The Quan Finn has a lot of similarities to him. He doesn't have the strongest arm, but he has a good enough arm strength that he can make the majority of throws necessary that you need him to make. His accuracy has improved every single season that he's been the starter at Toledo, and with Hugh Freeze, an innovative offensive mind, and the SEC with the talent that he could have around him potentially. This is somebody who could blow up, and he's a name that not too many people are paying attention to. Tyler Van Dyke, former Miami Hurricanes quarterback. I got him transferring to Mississippi State, playing for a new head coach, Jeff Lebby. Jeff Lebby, he could be the perfect guy to get Tyler Van Dyke playing at the level that a lot of people thought that he would play at prior to last season starting with Miami. You see, the problem with Tyler Van Dyke is that he's really inconsistent, he struggles to see the field, and he can get really reckless with the football at times. But when he's on, this dude is one of the most talented quarterbacks in the game. Go back and watch that game that he had against Texas A&M. He shredded that defense up. When you can get him in rhythm, and you can get him being calmed and relaxed and poised in the pocket. This is a great quarterback. He has a rifle for the arm, for an arm, great size. He isn't incredibly mobile, but he does have enough athleticism that he can extend a couple of plays here and there. He can pick up some yards on the ground, maybe five or six if you give him a running lane, maybe. But going to Jeff Lebby is really going to be the perfect situation to have Tyler Van Dyke playing up to his potential. This dude has had a really roller coaster of a career up to this point. His freshman season, he came in and replaced of the Eric King, and he was lightning in the bottle. He looked like he was going to be the next great Miami Hurricanes quarterback. If he would have played the whole entire season when he first was in as a freshman at Miami, he was on pace for 40 touchdowns as a freshman. 
And then after that, things just went downhill. He's battled with injuries as well. Jeff Levy could be the perfect head coach who could unlock the full potential of Tyler Van Dyke. He's one of the more highly regarded offensive minds in the sport. Many people have a lot of good things to say about him. He's worked with Lane Kiffin. He was pretty good calling plays for Oklahoma. Tyler Van Dyke and Jeff Levy, it would be a perfect pairing. You're going to have a young offensive-minded coach that's looking to find his quarterback, and you're going to have a young quarterback that's looking to find the head coach who can unlock his potential and have him playing at a high level. This is somebody who, not too long ago, was projected to be a first-round pick in the NFL. So if you can get him playing back at that level that he was when he first came on the scene for Miami as a freshman, Mississippi State, could be a really interesting team in 2024 if they get Tyler Van Dyke and Jeff Levy can have this dude playing up to his potential. Lastly, I got DJ Uyunglele. I think it's common sense that he'll transfer to Florida State. There also has been some reports that say that Louisville is also really interested in his services as well. This may be the most weirdest quarterback that I've ever watched in all my years watching college football. I've never seen a quarterback look this bad looking this good as well and I know it sounds weird how I worded it but if you watch this dude play you will understand what I mean by that he doesn't make a lot of great decisions at times sometimes he just looks like he's just out there throwing the football going to FSU however with one of the best coaching staffs in college football I really believe that they can give DJ Uyunglele the development that he needs to make him a fully well-rounded quarterback. He has a great arm. He's a really great athlete, especially with his size and how difficult he is to bring down in the open field. All he really needs to do is improve his decision-making. His decision-making and accuracy can be really erratic at times, and he's the best bad quarterback that I've ever watched in all my years watching college football. He's not bad. He's not good. He's, he's, I don't know. At times, he can be great. At times, he can be really bad, like in the second half against Washington. So he's a really weird quarterback. I really don't know how I feel about DJ Uyunglele. All I know is that he's good enough to be a good replacement for Jordan Travis because after what I saw out of Tate Rodermaker against Florida and whoever that other random quarterback was that they had in against Louisville in the ACC championship, they aren't better than DJ Uyunglele. And if Florida State can't get one of these big name QBs in the portal, such as a Will Howard, a Dante Moore, a Dylan Gabriel, or a Cam Ward, DJ Uyunglele wouldn't be too bad. Especially with how good Mike Novell's coaching staff is, they can develop this dude and have this dude playing at his highest potential or his highest ceiling, in a sense. Because I still don't think that DJ Uyunglele has reached his ceiling. You see, when he first started. In place of Trevor Lawrence, when he had to miss a game due to injury, this dude looked like he was going to be the next great Clemson quarterback. Then when he was the full-time starter for Clemson, the offensive line, the play calling held him back. He also wasn't that great himself. He goes to Oregon State. He had a pretty good season this past year with Jonathan Smith. Could have been a lot better if his accuracy and decision-making were to improve. FSU could be the perfect place to have DJ Uyunglele playing at his highest level. And like I said earlier, we haven't seen this dude play his best football yet. So I love to see DJ Uyunglele playing for Florida State this year. I feel like there's still a lot of potential that he has that has yet to be unleashed. And FSU could be the perfect school to bring it out of him. But this is it for my transfer portal quarterback predictions. Let me know your predictions for where you think these quarterbacks are going to transfer to down in the comment section down below. Washington! has been the most underrated team in college football all season long. And when you look at the odds for who has the best chance to win a national championship, Alabama, Michigan, and Texas all have better odds than Washington. They have the fourth best odds to win it all this year. And once again, don't underrate and underestimate this Washington team like how Oregon did in the Pac-12 championship when they were a 10-point underdog and they ended up smacking those boys. This is a good enough team that not only are they good enough to beat Texas, but they can beat Alabama and Michigan and whoever they potentially could face off against in the national championship if they make it through the Longhorns. And the reason why I'm really high on Washington is because, first of all, they got one of the best coaching staffs in all of college football. Kalen DeBoer, 
He's only lost two games in the two seasons that he's been the head coach of the Huskies. And he hasn't lost a game in the year, pretty much. And at Fresno State, he went 9-3 his final season. And when he was coaching NAIA ball, he didn't really lose too many games there. This is somebody who is a proven winner. He makes really good in-game adjustments. And he does a really good job at making sure that his teams are well prepared in big games. He also has a really great offensive coordinator in Ryan Grubb. If you guys don't remember, when Nick Saban was doing his offensive coordinator search, he interviewed Ryan Grubb. And the reason why he didn't hire Ryan Grubb is because him and Nick Saban had some differences with how the offense was going to run. So he returns back to Washington, and he's one of the best play callers in the sport. And I don't get how he won, how he was no finalist for the Burroughs Award, which goes to the best assistant coach in America because he definitely is one of them. And when you look at how well this coaching staff is, you are going to be in a situation where you shouldn't end up being in any game that you end up getting blown out in. Because when you got a really good coaching staff, that can be the difference. Not all the time being talent. You see Washington, people's arguments for why Washington won't win the dogs because, oh, they're the least talented team in the playoffs. Based on what? Because their coaching staff is really great. And the talent that they have on this team, especially at wide receiver, is fantastic. Nobody in this playoffs has as deep as a wide receiving core as what Washington has outside of Texas. And even then, I still would take Washington's receivers because they got three potential first rounders starting for them at wide out. You got Roma Dunze, who possibly is going to be a top 15 selection in the 2024 NFL draft. You got Jalen McMillan. You got Jalen Polk. There's just so much talent at wide receiver that there's not a lot of defenses in the playoffs that are going to be able to match up well when you got to defend against three elite wide receivers. Most teams only have two high-end corners. Most teams don't have three deep at cornerback that's good enough to defend against this wide receiving core of Washington. Then you got Michael Penix slinging the football. Michael Penix has been one of the best quarterbacks in college football ever since he first transferred to Washington, has one of the strongest arms in the nation, makes great football, makes great decisions with the football. He's also a pretty good athlete as well. My only concern with Michael Penix is that you need him to start the game out fast. There's been times this season when he's got out the slow starts for Washington. Now, you can say that may be due to the weather. Maybe he was playing through an injury, but he gets better as the game goes, goes along, right? And with these receivers, there's no reason why Washington's passing attack should struggle against any team they go up against in the playoffs, especially Texas in the first round. Texas' biggest weakness on defense are their cornerbacks. And with how good this wide receiving core is, you could definitely expect for Michael Penix to have a big day against that Longhorns defense. Now, defensively, you know, that's where a lot of people are going to kind of sour over picking Washington to win it all this year. And their defense isn't as talented as what Texas, Michigan, or Alabama's is. But I will say this, over the second half of this season, this defense has played way better than what they did to start the season off. And actually, this defense is a reason why they still are undefeated. You see, this defense was able to keep Oregon State from winning the game. They also helped them survive an upset potentially against Arizona State. This defense has came through for Washington and plenty of big situations. And when you look at how they played in the Pac-12 championship, that was probably the best defense that Oregon has ever faced off against during their two-year stretch with Bo Nix. There hasn't really been a defense that has been able to have the level of success against Oregon that Washington has been able to. They were able to get pressure on Bo Nix. They were able to limit the amount of explosive runs that Oregon had with Bucky Irving. This is a Washington defense that's playing their best football. They may not be as talented as what the Crimson Tide and Michigan and Texas are. But don't sleep on this defense. They're good enough to get a couple of key stops and give the ball back to their offense. People make it seem like you need to have an elite defense to win a national championship. You just need to have a top 50 defense and a defense that's good enough to get you a couple of key stops here and there. And that's what Washington has. When you look at their offensive line, probably one of the best in all of college football. And they probably got the second best offensive line in the playoffs this season. 
behind either Michigan or Texas. But I say that Washington's offensive line is better than Texas. They only gave up 10 sacks this year. Some people say that Texas has a better offensive line than Washington, but I would digress on that. I'll take Washington's offensive line over Texas. I don't really know about Michigan. Their offensive line is just built differently. But this offensive line is good enough that Michael Penix is going to have time to throw the football on any defense that he's going to be faced off against. Texas has a really good pass rush. I think this offensive line should be able to neutralize that. Same thing with Michigan and Alabama. Plus, this is also a really good pass blocking offensive line and a really good offensive line when it comes to opening up holes in the running game. And you see, when you think of Washington, you don't think of a team that is really great running the football because statistically, they don't rank all that high in rushing yards per game. But if you watch this team, you will know that whenever they want to run the football, they have success doing it. It's just that who the hell needs to run the football when you can air the football out 40, 50 times a game because you got Michael Penning sack quarterback and three talented wide receivers that are NFL caliber. Washington is being severely slept on when it comes to their chances of winning it all this year. With how deep they are at wide receiver, there aren't too many teams in the nation that can match up with this wide receiver room at corner. And plus, with Michael Penix at the helm, as long as this dude can get out to a fast start and he's playing his best football, you're going to have a hard time getting this offense off the field. And defensively, like I said, they don't got an outstanding defense, but this is a top 50 defense that's good enough for them to win it all. LSU didn't have a top 50 defense when they won a national championship in 2019. And this Washington team, I think, is a lesser version of what 2019 LSU was with Dylan Johnson at running back, with all the talent that they have at wide receiver, how good their offensive line is. Not saying they are exactly. The same team as LSU when they won it all in 2019, but they're really similar. They're like 50 to 60 percent of what that 2019 LSU squad was when they had Joe Burrow at quarterback. So if you're sleeping on this Washington team, you might want to wake up on them because they definitely are good enough to beat any team in the playoffs this year. I don't get why the odds for them winning it all this year is so low. And people have been sleeping on this team nearly every single week after they beat Oregon the first time they played. Listen, style points doesn't determine how good a team is. You got to judge a team by how well coached they are, which Kalen DeBoer always has this team ready to, ready to play. They play their best football in the biggest games when the lights are the brightest. And you got Michael Penix and a great group of wide receivers that not too many defenses are going to be able to stop, including Michigan's, Alabama's, and Texas. Michigan has the best defense in the playoffs this year. But if they match up against Washington in the national championship, I don't think they're that deep at cornerback where they're going to be able to slow down this passing attack with a Dunze, McMillan, and Polk. People need to start giving Washington way more respect than what they have over the last couple of weeks, this is the most disrespected team in the playoffs this year. And these are my reasons why I believe the Huskies can win the 2024 National Championship. This is it for this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. If you enjoy, leave a like, subscribe to the channel. Remember that every episode of the podcast is available in audio format on all podcasting platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts from, you can find the JT Sports Podcast. And I will see you guys shortly with another episode.